I think the, the whole journey, training and racing included, is just, it's all about fulfillment. If you have something that you're fulfilled with, that you can put your energy and your attention towards on a daily basis, for me, that's just kind of the key to a really happy, a good life. What does it mean to navigate the Olympic stream? What can we learn from the journey, the destination, and beyond? I'm Adam Creek, and this is Row Row Tokyo, exploring the past, present, and future of the Canadian rowing athletes on their path to Tokyo 2020. We've got a good show for you today. I'm interviewing the two gentlemen from the men's pair, Conlon McCabe and Kai Langerfeld. Some interesting themes came out of this conversation, including how sport is an escape from the drudgery of manual labor, blue collar existence. Another key theme that came out of this was uh, the power of partnerships and how sport really helps you peel off the layers of the onion and truly connect with another person, with another human being. I really enjoyed this talk. We got into some of the training methodologies, the differences between Spracklin, uh, Martin McElroy, Dick Tonks, and we dug into some interesting facts. For example, Kai loves drinking Coke. <laughs> Something I would have never uh, expected. Dial your ears in, get ready for a good listen, a heartfelt listen, and get to know the Canadian men's pair training for Tokyo 2020. I wanted to start with Kai. How did you start in the sport and what got you going? My dad, York, was a rower himself and he rode in the 76 Olympics. So that's oh. always kind of been in our family. I've always been athletic and super passionate about sports. And I guess I was kind of doing that for like 17, 18 years and then took a break while I was in doing odd jobs and just working. And uh, I really wanted to get back into sports as I missed that kind of team aspect. And that was basically the catalyst that got me into, into rowing. So what kind of work did you do when you took time off from sport? I did roofing for three years. A uh, roofer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which is like, which is harder than rowing, actually. Like one of the hardest physical things I've ever done. What's so hard about roofing? The guys I was working with were like, all they did was work. They would work 10 to 12 hours a day, just nonstop. And I can remember one guy, he was maybe 65, 70 years old. Yeah. And he would work from 8 a.m. to 5 to 6 p.m. without stopping. He wouldn't take a break for lunch. He wouldn't drink water. And he, he was crazy. Just the work ethic on this man was just absurd. So I did that for about three years. And uh, actually, I really enjoyed it just because like it was just just labor all day. And I feel like that's something that I kind of actually enjoy, but it, it was, you know, it gets to the point where, okay, kind of what's next. And for me, that was just going back to school. Um, so I moved to Victoria with my best friend at the time. I got a job at Costco. That was the point where I was just really missing sport, like really, really missing that kind of competitive um, atmosphere. So it was while I was working at Costco that, I had the idea of getting into rowing. What spawned the idea? Well, I mean, I've, I've told this story a few times, but um, I was working in with the rotisserie chickens one day, just like getting getting the chickens ready, like on the spit. <laughs> Those delicious and, uh, chickens. <laughs> oh, yeah, delicious. <laughs> Honestly, it just it was just like a light bulb that just came to me, and I just said in my head, I was like. I'm going to go to the Olympics and rowing. And that was it. Rotis so what about the rotisserie chickens? Was it the smell, the, the rhythmic rotation, uh, the, the dull red light? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was the, probably the fact that I was just at a place in my life where I was handling chickens throughout yeah. the day, where yeah. I was like, this isn't for me. This is just a job that I'm doing to pay my way through school. And yeah, well, it's... It's fascinating because when I think back to my own, you know, um, personal story, my personal life, I spent some time working on the oil rigs up in northern Alberta. Mm -hmm. And I had 
a similar moment where I was working in this shack called the accumulator shack, lots of hydraulics that we were maintaining. I was working, you know, hard work, 12 hour days, rough lifestyle outdoors. And I had kind of a similar thought as just, it's like, this isn't, I'm not happy here. This isn't, this doesn't seem to be the path that I want to the lead. And sport can be almost an escape from the dullness and the drudgery of the I actually have a a similar experience that I'll share right now as well, too. I'd already been rowing for a while and went to the 2010 senior world championships. We were in the B final and it was disappointing in the men's aid. And I went back to Brockville, Ontario, my hometown, and I got a job basically so I could fly back out West and go to school. And I boxed basketballs for eight hours a day. So I inflated (laughs) basketballs then put those boxes on them that you see in stores so they can go to Winners or Walmart or Canadian Tire or whatever, and then stacked them up on pallets and loaded them on trucks. And I probably inflated thousands of basketballs. And uh, I knew after about two days of doing that, that I was, you know, going to do my best when I got back to school and I was going to commit myself to rowing and that I didn't want to be, you know, doing this in a warehouse. And it just, it was hard work. And uh, I definitely got, got the paycheck and, was able to get the flight, but it really, you know, refocused me on how lucky I am to be able to row and how I didn't want to take any of it for granted or not commit myself fully to it and try to get the most out of it. So those moments when you're working those jobs that are tough, laborious, blue collar jobs, it's like you really realize how lucky we are to all be rowers and to Mm -hmm. have the opportunity to do this. Like compare rowing to a blue collar job because it's, you know, rowing, you know, in the history of rowing, there used to be what were called the professionals. And then uh, there were those who were uh, more blue collar rowers who actually just rowed boats every day, transporting lumber. I'm just thinking on the Thames River. With that thought in the background, how do you think rowing compares to blue collar work and blue collar rowing? I think at times definitely rowing can feel like just a labor job where you're just doing this task for hours on end. It can potentially be a little bit mind numbing, but I also would kind of say that like for someone like myself, who's not naturally very creative, like I'm not very artistic or anything like that. Rowing's just like a very big uh, creative outlet for me. It's like somewhere where, okay, yeah, you're working hard a lot and you're doing this singular thing, but you're also able to kind of put your personal touch on this thing that you're doing. So tell me how you put your personal touch on the sport, Kai. I mean, it's anything from just doing a steady state row in the single to racing. Yes, it's a team sport, but you're also an individual. You can kind of do things, I guess, that you might not be able to do at a standard like blue collar job. So tell me about some of the explorations you've been able to, or experiments you've been able to orchestrate. I just wanted to try something different. Like we've been doing these long rows and uh, they've been going pretty well. But, you know, one day I just wanted to see how long I could go holding a certain speed or whatever it was. So I just decided that one day or one morning I was just going to do 40K basically like as fast as I could. And that, that was actually great. It was just like a really, really good row. And, you know, I did the 40K. And, uh, yeah, that was basically just like me, you know, trying something new and just having this like outlet. Did you stop for water or do you stop for nutrition at all? Or you just went? No, I just went, I just, I had a can of Coke before and that was good. And <laughs> yeah, I just went dock to dock. So with the Coke, obviously there's the caffeine and the sugar. You don't find that that sort of burns up pretty quickly and, uh, you notice it being gone. I'm curious about using that as a, an ergogenic aid uh, to assist in training. No, no, I actually, I, I love Coke. I drink it actually quite a bit. And I mean, you see like professional cyclists drinking Coke when they're in the tour. And I've heard that Floyd Mayweather used to like drink Coke almost every day for training. So I find it really helpful, actually. I can vouch for Kai there, Adam. When we're out training, like, Kai doesn't need to stop on a 20K row ever for water when almost everyone else I've ever rode with is pasty mouth and thirsty after 45 minutes. But I, I think part of that too is uh, like your approach towards the row, Kai, you're always looking to find uh, really good efficiency and to do something that is sustainable. And I think he has a really good 
vision for each row as to how long it is and the kind of pace he can hold it. And I, I think that Kai is one of the, he's, I, I'd say the best in the world at pacing any, any row, any distance. He can always really nail it to get the most out of himself. He's just, he, I think you're really good at that. So Conlon, I want to get a bit of a, an idea of your past, where, where you came from and what path brought you to this world of rowing. Well, I first picked up an oar when I was nine years old and it was because my uh, mom rode. Uh, she rode a pair with her twin sister just in Ontario, Brockville, Ontario, where I'm from. It's a small town and I lived just a few blocks away from the rowing club and uh, it was a great summer activity to get out of the house. By the time I was entering uh, high school, I'd kind of already been identified by the coaches there as a potential high school rower and uh, Doug Marshall phoned me up, the same coach who coached my mom and said, come on down to the boathouse tomorrow. And I went out for uh, practice in the launch. I sat in the launch and we followed two Cox fours rowing around the St. Lawrence River. At the end of the row, when we came back to the boathouse, there were three guys that were on shore that day, erging. And Doug said, okay, if you come back tomorrow and bring shorts and a t-shirt, those three guys get to go in a four with you and they get to row instead of being stuck on land. So I was roped into my first practice, but I uh, I loved it and got an opportunity to race just three weeks after that. And yeah, I, I started rowing and I immediately fell in love with a lot of the things in the sport that er- everyone does. Like there was a great group of guys training at the Brockville Rowing Club that were all like-minded, highly motivated and had all these long-term goals. And it was awesome to be a part of. And I also was already kind of addicted to team sports. I love playing hockey and seemed like great off-season training for that before I knew it though I was you know focused more on rowing than anything because I sensed that there was more potential for myself in rowing it kept evolving and then I know you ended up going to the University of Washington was that straight out of Brockville yep yeah so I got to go to two junior worlds while I was in high school and my second one it was my high school coach who actually took me to junior worlds in Beijing in a pair in 2007, it was awesome. And after that silver medal result, I was recruited by Washington to go to university there on a rowing scholarship. It's quite an experience to go to a U.S. school and be a part of a big athletic program like that. Well, I almost want to compare and contrast your experience at the University of Washington with Kai's experience at UVic. I mean, if you're going to one of these big U.S. schools, especially at Washington, right away you're going to be rowing with all the top junior rowers from around the world who are fairly well trained already coming in and have high skill level, high expectations. And you'll get to row in an eight that's probably going to go 540, 535. And when you're training at that kind of speed and that kind of group, it's like you can learn a lot from these other guys who have a ton of talent too. And it's as close to a national team program as you can get, I I think, with the NC2A rules. But uh the, I guess the downfall right away potentially could be that they just race eights when at Canadian universities you can race single, pair, four, eight. There's just a different development and focus in the Canadian system, right? So it might be better for some athletes. What about the your UVic experience, Kai? I mean, going into my first year at the UVic program, um, I was a novice and the varsity team was like the reigning like Canadian champion just right away I was kind of looking up to to all the guys on the varsity um so that motivated me as like an individual to like get to their level Conlon you're giving advice to a rower do you go to America or Canada or does it matter it depends what the athlete's goals are if they're explicitly saying that they want to go to the Olympics I'm going to tell them that at the end of the day it actually won't matter whether you go to a U.S. school or a Canadian school. That won't be the deciding factor. It's um, There are opportunities for you to make it to the Olympics no matter what school you go to. And that's been proven by athletes who've gone to many number of different schools or who haven't gone to schools at all and made it to the Olympics. I would try to honestly remind a lot of kids that it's student athlete for a reason. You're a student first and an athlete second when you're in school and that you have to have that balance between academics and athletics. And you should think about that because there is life after rowing as well too. 
A huge thank you to our title sponsor, Nicola Wealth, the gold standard of investment advice for affluent families, foundations, and institutions across North America. Nicola Wealth is also the premier partner of the Can Fund 150 Women, where women support female athletes and each other to achieve excellence. Nicola Wealth also has their own podcast, The Wealth Exchange. This show is full of great interviews and inspires you to achieve your aspirations beyond wealth. Providing access to experts, topics explore leadership impact, wealth planning and investing, philanthropy and building better businesses. Listen to The Wealth Exchange with a quick search for Nicola Wealth on your favorite podcast listening app. Tell me a little bit about your international experience, Conlon, and uh, how you ended up in the pair with, with Kai. Yeah, my first senior experience would have actually been the uh, Cox pair in 2009. I got to row under 23s that summer in a four, and I was super uh, excited to break onto the senior circuit. I got to row with Jan Ties and Mark Laidlaw, and it was a uh, pretty awesome summer. We were the spares for the men's eight, raced in Poznan, Poland. And I knew when I was racing in that Cox pair that I wanted to make it into the men's eight the next year. And that that was the folks at the time with Mike Spracklin as the coach, that we were going to build a strong eight and make a push for the Olympics. And there were also a few guys returning from the gold medal Beijing eight that you were a part of, Adam. Andrew Burns was committed to returning to the eight at the time. And then uh, Malcolm joined us as well. And, uh, yeah, so I was focusing on making, making the Canadian eight go fast in the summer and the University of Washington eight in the school year. And when it came to the Olympic year, I decided to take the year off school for obvious reasons to commit to the guys in the program and get the most out of myself. And yeah, we had, a, we had a great run that year and it was good. It ended in a silver medal. Then uh, Kai was just joining the center at that time. Maybe it was 2011 Kai or December of 2011, I think. Yeah. So Kai, Kai and Kevin Light trained that whole Olympic year with us under Mike and, uh, Okay. That was when I first met Kai, and uh, Kevin and Kai were a pairing for most of that year. Then it would have been after the London Olympics, would have been my first time really rowing with Kai in 2013, but uh, he ended up having an injury, right? And didn't make the four because you, you had a back injury. Then 2014, Kai and I started rowing together. So that's seven years ago now. I think we would have raced the pair that year. I'm not sure if it was 2014 or 2015, but we would have raced the pair that year. An old black Vespoli pair on Burnaby Lake against Gibson and Crothers. And that would have been our first time rowing together. But we were focused on uh, building a men's four at that time after the London Olympics. What would you add to that, Kai? How did you make the transition from UVic to the national team? Summer of 2011, um, I was fortunate enough to do some workouts with Scott and Dave in the pair. And then I was included in that uh, 2011 Pan Am team. And then from there, I was just kind of thrown into Mike, Mike Spracklin's group that winter. And yeah, I was just kind of like the spare alternate for that training year um, leading into the London Olympics. So that was my start. Both of you trained under Spracklin. Yep. Uh, and then 2016, your coach was uh, Martin McElroy. And yep. then this round, it's been... Dick Tonks, has that been Dick Tonks for the full cycle? Terry Paul was the coach for 2017, and then Dick came in um, the following winter. I'd love you to compare and contrast your experiences under each of those coaches. This is It's a really good question, and a lot of people always ask about uh, Dick and Spracklin in particular because they both have such a high pedigree and so many uh, successful crews. They're kind of like the top rowing gurus in the sport, if you will, Adam. And uh, I feel very lucky to have been coached by two of them. There are some similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well. So uh, the things that are similar, they both have a clear vision as to how they want how you how they want you to row, and they have very specific programs they write. And the program is kind of designed for you to row a certain way to get through it. And so uh, I think that's kind of how they establish their technical differences, if you will. Tell me the specific, what's the specific way that Spracklin wanted you to row? You're really focused on uh, swinging over 
quickly like swing and holding the finish really, really long. So it was. So when you this, say swinging over at the finish, so hold the finish long, momentum yeah. around the turn. Yeah, using your body to swing at the finish and having momentum there to, you know, as you move, as you swing over, move your weight over on the uh, seat, the boat's going to, the bow is going to sort of move forward towards the finish line, if you will. That That's kind of the, the Spracklin stroke or yeah. the, you know, one of the defining characteristics of it. And obviously when you train, you're holding the finish longer and longer. And Mike always told that story that, he never told anyone to lay back or to row with such dramatic body swing, but he said to hold the finish and athletes started laying back to hold the finish. And then since the rating was capped and they were doing side-by-side -side runs, whoever laid back the most would move their boat the fastest. And then that was the evolution that happened that Mike would say he didn't even coach, but just, you know, the way the program was written and the way the athletes adapted to it, that's the way they rode. And I think that there's something similar there with Dick as well, too, because he writes a program that has very high volume where you're rowing long distances and you have to adapt to rowing a certain way to make it through those workouts. It's slightly different. And I think it's uh, slightly more focused on finding efficiency and carrying the right amount each stroke instead of, you know, driving it with length and holding on to it longer and longer to try to establish yourself as one of the top athletes in the program. I also think that like Mike would have a lot more meetings and talk to his athletes a lot more and, you know, try to get everyone on the same page and ask everyone what they thought about each call or each word where uh, Dick has a lot more of a hands-off approach. Dick definitely wants his crews to figure out a lot of things on their own. Like you have to be able to be somewhat autonomous and uh, na navigate the workouts yourself figure out things within the boat and the setup yourself, make a lot of changes and adaptations by yourself. So definitely rowing in Dick's program, it's helpful if you have a lot of previous experiences to get you through it. It's a, it's a tough program. Part of it is there's always curveballs with Dick too. And like we kind of had, we're just really used to them now at this point, but take this morning, for example, uh, you know, there's no set program necessarily, but you know, it's a Wednesday morning and you're expecting something kind of hard and we show up at the boathouse and right when you're about to go hands on the boat, he goes five by 1750 from a start open rate. Oh, okay. So, you know, there was, there was no workout on the program and you don't know what you're going to do and you kind of have to be prepared for anything. And that's what we got this morning. It's like, all right, this is going to be one hell of a workout. Here we go. It really makes it so that we're in charge of it. And we feel, I feel a lot of control in what we're doing, even though we don't have any control in what we might be doing when we show up at the boathouse. So yeah, it's a, it's a great program that way for having to figure things out on the fly and having to roll with the punches. I mean, the man, he knows what he's doing. Like he's been doing this for so long and he's like, he's seen the best of the best. So the guy, the guy knows what he's doing. I think just with me, I don't try and like, understand like what some of his tactics are and i think maybe that's that right there is mm. that's kind of the magic so you're kind of forced to be like he's not going to be that with me at the start line so this is up to me so i have to do it so i think maybe that is kind of like the magic touch i don't know though probably the most memorable and hard day that i've had with dick was um, a couple years ago we did um, just shy of 70K in one day. Oh, God. Um, and 95% of that 70K was pretty much like as hard as you could go at rate 20. And I just remember like the last 2K run of that day, we were in the pair and it was like a competitive workout. I was completely empty, but I still had like a lot to give in some weird way. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember that too. Yeah. It's, yeah. and it, there is obviously something physically happening that, you'd be better off to have a physiologist on your podcast to explain it accurately. But also there's something mentally happening that you can just feel of like letting everything go and just doing it at that point. You're not overthinking it. You're too tired to try and fight it. You just completely like let go of everything. You're just going in the boat up and down. And I think that's where you really like learn or you train how you want to be in a race where you're just letting everything go and you're just going for it. You're not trying to figure it out. You're just doing it.
that's the way that we want to race as a pair. And that's the kind of thing that we're able to do now because we've been in this boat for so long and, you know, spent so much time together that it's just completely automatic and just go out and do it. And that's the best feeling in the sport really to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, you almost go, you get so exhausted that you just go animal. Your, your brain doesn't have the ability to, to think or analyze or adjust. I, I, I think Dick is aware of that as a, as a coach. Like he said to me a few times at the end of these really long rows, like, Oh yeah, you were finally, like you guys were just moving with the boat at the end and that was it. You were too tired to do anything else. And that's the way you want to row. And that's what I think I was getting at at the very start too, mm. saying how the program is built to make you row a certain way just the way Mike Spracklin's program was built to make you row a certain way at a certain point to survive in either program, you have to make the right adaptations. And I think that that's kind of one thing I've noticed with all these great rowing coaches or just, you know, great trainers in general is that the body adapts, right. And, and it's uh, it, it is cool. And I have witnessed that and experienced it myself. Well, and I'm, I love that phrase that you said. You were tired, too tired to do anything else, said Dick. You were, you're finally rowing with the boat. Yeah. Right. And how do you yeah. get that? So now you're doing, let's go back to today and this morning, you have those 1750 meter pieces. You obviously have an idea of how you want the pieces to go. You have um, an execution plan that you want to follow. How do you carry that? you know, that magical last 2K of rowing from the 70K into the 1750 meter pieces that you're doing. You know the feeling of when things are working well and, you know, you're just kind of in that flow state. I think trying to find that, or sorry, I guess not even trying to find that, but just having that confidence that you're just kind of on cruise control at that point and you're just going out and just kind of executing and, you know, enjoying it and having fun. And I and you corrected your thought when you're you're sharing. You said, "Well, it's you you want to um, you want to find that state," but then you mm -hmm. said, "No, you have the confidence that you will be in that state." Mm -hmm. And I want you to talk about the dissonance between those two thoughts and why you corrected it. I think with a sport like rowing, where rhythm is such like a huge aspect of it, if you're searching for it or if you're like fighting for it. It's not going to be there. I think there's a point where you have to just kind of like succumb to like the way you naturally do things and just allow that to kind of take over. Yeah. Surrender. The times where I'm going the best are the times where I'm kind of thinking the least. So how do you keep that when the lights turn on in Tokyo? You know, you're going to get out there and get caught up in the moment. You're going to be warming up. You're going to be enjoying it. You're going to be super nervous. You're going to see your competitors. We're going to see the Croatians, the Australians, all, all these different boats. And like, it's going to be our first time seeing them in a long time and you're going to be warming up and you're going to get in the starting gates. You're going to have to kill that kind of two, three awkward minutes where you're just breathing, you know, making sure your water bottle is in the right place and getting everything dialed in. And then the race starts and that's it. Like it's automatic then at that point, right? You're just, you're going out, you're taking the same strokes you took in the warm up, and you trained all year. And like, it's just one of those things that it can be really, really scary if you're sitting there and talking about it, but like when you're doing it, it's just one of those moments that you're in and like you're doing your thing. Right. And like, that's it. Yeah. So tell me yeah. about the other crew. Cause I don't know who are the other crews you anticipate being in the final with you. The top crews, the Croatian men's pair for sure. The, the Sinkovic brothers. Yeah. They, uh, they didn't win worlds in 2017. The Italians won. Yeah. The Croatians won gold in the men's double in 2016 and they decided to make the transition into the men's pair and uh, they've done a really good job of it. They just won the first world cup in Croatia at home. And they're probably a lot, a lot of people's favorite crew for the race would be my guess. So how are the Sinkovic brothers going to race? They open up in the first 500 and they try and, you know, get a half a length ahead of everyone through the first thousand of the race. They essentially keep trying to row to the front they'll keep pushing until they get a gap. And then if a few times, well, I guess, you know, maybe only the Italians really have rode them down at the very end, but they'll keep pushing till they, uh, till they get ahead. It's kind of how it looks like they go. So we got the Croatians and then you say the Italians will be in there. They'll be pretty good. The Italians are really good. We, uh, we raced them a handful of times in the four last quadrennial. 
and uh, we had some good battles against the Stern pair. Is there anything special about their race plan or, or their strategy that? Well, you know, like uh, they can change pace really well at either end, I guess. It, it seems like a lot of the Italian crews, this quadrennial, love a big sprint. What about the Aussies? Uh, the Aussies are a bit of an unknown. They've had a pair that's changed a few times, but those guys might be in the four now or something. So we, we don't know who the Aussie guys are. In the men's pair, it's Croatia that have set themselves apart. But other than that, I think that it's a, it's a really tight field. And there's been lots of changing podium results through World Cups over the past few years. And I, I wouldn't want to write anyone off. And so let's talk about the, like the personal journey. Like at the end of the day, it is a personal journey. You're not doing it for the money. At least I hope not. <laughs> the, to, to be famous as a rower isn't really much fame, to be honest. You're participating in an experience that will leave an impact in your mind for the rest of your life. So what, what do you want to get out of it? I mean, I think the I think the the whole journey, training and racing included, is just it's all about fulfillment. If you have something that you're fulfilled with, that you can kind of put your energy and your attention towards on a daily basis, I mean, for me, that's just kind of the key to a really happy, a good life. You find that the the sport of rowing, you know, the journey, the process, the preparation, you know, the racing, it's very easy for you to to constantly think about the sport. Yeah, I mean, I think the sport has given me so much in general. I'm just so, so happy that I've gone through this journey and all the things I'll take forward. What has the sport given you? Everything. That's, yeah. that's let's get some more specifics. <laughs> <laughs> it's given you the excuse to down cans of Coke every day. It's yeah. <laughs> given you the ability to go on 70 kilometer rows and absolutely lose yeah. yourself into the feel of the boat. Yeah. It's giving you the opportunity yeah. to travel all around the world. Tell me more. Yeah, I mean, obviously, those are all, like, really cool things, and that's all, like, you can definitely say that, and that's, like, those are pretty good highlights, but I think, like, on a deeper level, like, the sport has just given me a lot of things that I don't know if I would have found elsewhere. And so, mm -hmm. like, I'm just super, super grateful for that. And just when you're grateful for something, it's so easy to just, like, throw your life into something. And rowing's kind of given me that feeling. I think more recently, like just being in a pair and just like a two man boat, you're sharing those downs with just one other person. I think what it can do is just really force you to have like honest communication with just another person. And just that kind of ability to like, you're almost forced to like work things out with someone. And uh, that's pretty special. That's pretty, uh, you know, that's a pretty cool thing to go through. Yeah, that is powerful. What have, what have you learned most from karma? When he tells me something that comes from like an honest place where he's just like, he just tells me what he's feeling like very honestly, that to me is the best kind of feedback and talk that I can have. Cause we've definitely had our moments where you've know, kind of gone at each other and just being able to work through those on like a kind of a deeper level is, it's pretty special. What do you learn most from Kai Conlon? I really appreciate just how focused Kai is. Like, I think that he brings a lot to the, boat to the training and to the racing that I'm not able to. We obviously have very different personalities. I don't know if they've come out throughout this podcast, but like, yeah, it's we're, great. We're, okay. They have. Yeah. All right. We're, 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 we're very different people. And uh, the things that he brings to the boat are the things that I think I need to get the most out of myself. He's extremely intrinsically motivated. He's focused on improving himself. He doesn't get caught up in a lot of the extra stuff around him. That's really good to have someone who's so focused. He's kind of taught me how to be more like that. And that's helped me to grow as an athlete. Yeah, it has been good to be in a partnership for so long, where like we have to have, you know, these conversations to figure out what each other are thinking, why each other respond to certain situations a certain way and grow as a partnership. We're going to be racing at least two sets of brothers are in pairs, right? And I mean, you have to imagine that brothers have very strong relationships and they've fought through everything you could imagine, right? And so our relationship has grown to be stronger and stronger over time. And it's, yeah, I mean, Kai's taught me a lot. As we mature and grow 
we have to go through this psychological integration and people have different personalities, pers different worldviews, different experiences, and being able to understand how the individual processes the, the environment differently and learning from, from them is so powerful. I remember when we would go through and we get funding from external funding partners, as I'm sure each of you have on the journey, they, they'd ask us questions. One of the questions they'd ask is like, who are your heroes? Who do you look up to? And I remember thinking like, I don't know, like, who are my heroes? Who do I look up to? And it was actually one of my teammates, Joe Stankovicius, who's like, you know who my heroes are? You know, it's all of you guys, right? Because I, I see something in all of you that I don't have. Like each of you have kind of this superhero characteristic that I can res I deeply respect because it's it fascinates me that you can show up in this manner and I and and I can't. It's inspiring to hear the respect that the both of you have for one another, and I think that will certainly help you come race day. I think it can too, and that makes a lot of sense what you said about Joe. It's the differences in the things that I don't personally have that Kai does that I have the most respect for really. It's the, it's the things that we do differently that we can both continue to learn from and hopefully make us a better partnership. Well, let's talk about beyond. Where to after Tokyo? Well, nowhere around Japan because we're flying straight home, so. <laughs> so that's, yeah, actually, that's good to know. Like, tell me a little bit more about, because I actually don't know the ins and outs of the like, uh, uh, <laughs> day. I think there's, uh, I think there's probably one day for like, in case the races get delayed because of bad weather and then we fly back. Yeah. So you race, it's 24 hours in Tokyo. I'm guessing you're supposed to, you know, stay in some type of bubble in the village and then fly back. And it's probably going to be hotel quarantine. Do you feel any regret? Like no Olympic parties, no seeing famous people. It's going to just be really tough for some people. Like you race at the Olympics and then you're isolated in a hotel for three days. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> oh, that's it's trouble. It's, that, it's not heartbreaking. It's a recipe for trouble. Like they've, yeah. There's going to be it's... some stories that come from that. Oh my goodness. So beyond that, so the <laughs> Olympics are done, right? You've had your experience and then you'll move on to the next thing. Like, have you given much thought to that? Yeah. I mean, it's something that I've been kind of thinking about and just knowing the kind of emotional ride you go on after the Olympics, this one, maybe being the last one. I mean, who knows, but like just kind of being aware of the things you go through. And I think maybe just trying to enjoy that process a little bit more. So afterwards, you haven't really thought of whether or not you're going to go to Paris. I guess that's only three years away now or move on to another career. Like, do you have a career that you'd think you'd want to participate in? Are you going to go back to roofing <laughs> after the Olympics are done? Or what's uh, yeah, what have you thought about not going back to that? No. <laughs> no. Right now, it's kind of the financial business world doing some courses and just kind of uh, getting exposed to a little bit more of that. I think I want to work in sport right now at this point and uh, want to work in some type of area where, you know, sport for development or trying to help people get into sport. And I also am tempted to just move completely out of the world of rowing and sport and try myself out in the private sector and just, see if all the soft skills that I've developed over these years of being on so many high performance teams could help me in the world of sales or something like that. So I, mm -hmm. I think I want to figure out what I have a natural aptitude for as well. Like I, I don't know other than rowing what else I could potentially be good at, but I want to find another area where I could succeed and maybe it's a risky thing to try and do, but potentially fill a little bit of the void that not being able to compete to be the best in the world might leave. See if I could find that in another vocation. And I think that's a tricky thing to go after, but I might see if I can do that. So sales yeah. is a good fit. When you, when you talk about it, I've met a lot of really top performing sales people who have an athletic background and they enjoy it. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. I will say this afterwards, the decompression period, I'm really looking forward to going for like a few long through hikes, like long, long walks, you know, like yeah. 25, 30 K a day, tent on my back, food, and just do a few of those with nice. a few close friends and family members. 
I think that's a great time to really think about next steps while you're just taking steps in the woods. I thought this was a good conversation. I'll let uh, Kai get back to chugging Coca-Cola classic or whatever he's drinking. And, uh, yep. <laughs> and, and I appreciate this conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Adam. Thanks for listening this far. As you can see, Kai and Colin are both incredible gentlemen and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can deliver on the games of Tokyo 2020. My hope is that these you know, young men and young women that we interview, uh, we can just help uncover some of that confirmation. Often, you know, the transformation that we feel through sport, through the experience of pushing ourselves to the limits of going into the dark days. When you go into those dark times, and you go into those moments of despondence and self-doubt and self-questioning, you start to figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And often it isn't a transformation that we go through, but a confirmation of who we should be and how we should act. Thanks for listening. And now a word from our sponsors. Executives, business owners, this is for you. This is for you because you might experience career anxiety or overwhelm that leaves you feeling like you may have a heart attack. Or maybe you have increasing thoughts where you're questioning your career path and maybe you need a new one. When I'm not recording podcasts, I'm using my best radio DJ voice to help high performing business leaders across North America align their work with who they are so they can achieve unprecedented career success without anxiety, without frustration and wanting to quit their job. You'll discover, clarify and implement personal and career strategies that move in parallel and increase your earnings, accomplishments and quite frankly, life enjoyment. Don't quit, fail, or worse, waste years of struggling to achieve your professional ambitions because you're experiencing the inevitable rough waters of business and professional life. Get more information at my website, creekspeak.com. That's with a K, K K-R-E-E-K-S-P-E-A-K.com to learn if executive coaching with me is a good fit for you. Thank you for listening to Roro Tokyo. Again, I'm your host, Adam Creek. Feel free to reach out to me with comments on Twitter at Adam Creek. That's at sign A-D-A-M-K-R-E-E-K. No, it's not like the river or the squeaky door. It's a creek with a K. A huge thank you to our title sponsor of this podcast, Nicola Wealth the gold standard of investment advice for affluent families, foundations, and institutions across North America. And another thank you to Whitehall Rowing and Sail and the Oar Board, which is the transportable, collapsible rower that you can take anywhere. Thank you, Rowing Canada, for your support to wrangle these athletes. And thank you, CBC, for promoting these conversations on your massive platform. This show is produced by the wonderful Mary Chan of Organized Sound Productions. The sound is edited and mixed by the creative Danelle Cloutier.